the Sega Saturn, a necessity for gracious living. There is no doubt that the fifth generation of console gaming was an extremely progressive period in the industry. The target demographic was shifting and expanding to include older, more mature players, but it could certainly be argued that the fifth generation of consoles were the systems that pushed technology and video games the furthest and at the quickest rate in comparison to all of the previous generations. Although there were already some CD or 32-bit based consoles on the market, it seemed like the 5th gen didn't kick off fully until our dear old friends at Sega threw in their proverbial hats into the proverbial ring and brought out a piece of hardware that absolutely shooketh the industry to its core but not necessarily for all the right reasons. That's right folks, today we're going to be reminiscing about that time Sega were perhaps just a little too eager to jump the gun and get ahead of the competition by looking back at the system that was meant to take the company to the next level, but ultimately ended up being one of the biggest catalysts to the start of their demise. I am Lady Decade and this is the rise and fall of the Sega Saturn. Although it was kept very hush-hush at the time, tentative and secretive plans for what would eventually become Sega's next proper 32-bit console were supposedly floating around from as early as spring of 1992, with the name Saturn at this point being merely a code name for the project. Development of the system was being overseen by Sega's director and deputy general manager of research and development, Hideko Sato, the man responsible for the lion's share of the work of the creation of all of Sega's major home consoles, and the man who would go on to serve as president of the company from 2001 to 2003. Mr. Sato, sir, we salute you. Sato has been with the Japanese gaming giants since April of 1971 and was one of the most respected figures in the entire organisation and the only person Sega would entrust with the responsibility of making sure their new 32-bit hardware was up to scratch. Given that Sega was still trying to push the Mega Drive and Mega CD at the time, progress on the system was initially slow, but the project would start making some headway when Sega entered into a partnership with electronics company Hitachi to jointly develop a new 32-bit CPU processor for the upcoming hardware. This fancy new creation would come to be known as the Super H Risk Engine, or SH2 for short, and would end up being not only the primary processor for the Saturn, but also for Sega's ill-fated Mega Drive add-on, the 32X, which we've just talked about here on this channel in a recent video. Go check it out after this one if you'd like to know more about Sega's most embarrassing failure to date. Piece of mushroom-looking trash. Don't do that. Although the Saturn and the 32X do both use a dual configuration of the two SH2 chips running in tandem, the big difference and what separated the Saturn as a truly next-gen gaming console was that it was also equipped with twin video display processors named VDP1 and VDP2, making it an extremely powerful and impressive bit of kit for the time. If that wasn't enough, the Saturn would also be equipped with its own custom Motorola sound processor with a Yamaha FH1 DSP processor inside, giving the system 32 sound channels, FM synthesis and 16-bit PCM sampling abilities. 
with the hardware's design all but completed by the end of 1993, the main focus of Project Saturn was initially going to be expanding on the foundations laid by the 16-bit Mega Drive and vastly improving on the graphical fidelity and overall visuals of 2D games, with little attention put on polygon-based 3D graphics. Which is weird, because games like Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing already existed. Plans would shift somewhat in early 1994, when someone at Sega HQ got wind of Sony's upcoming PlayStation console, which was currently in development and was said to have some rather powerful 3D processing capabilities under its hood. Recognising that this could tempt potential buyers away from Camp Sega and onto Team Sony, the typically overworked little Sega lab monkeys are set about rejigging the Saturn's already complicated innards to get closer to replicating the kind of specs found in Sony's new system. Rather than start from scratch though, the clever little Sega boffins added several new dedicated processes to the Saturn's inner workings to help with polygon texture mapping and share the workload with the main CPUs when demanding 3D graphics were being displayed. These additions made the already technically impressive Saturn an extremely capable and powerful one by the standards of the time. The only issue was, and this was a fairly substantial issue, all of those extra chips and processors made the Saturn especially difficult to program for. I mean, the thing is more chips than a Las Vegas poker table. This was one of the biggest problems that blighted the console throughout its lifespan, as this overly complicated collection of microchips lurking within the Saturn's ample plastic frame meant the system was a nightmare for developers, with even the most skilled finding it extremely difficult to be able to actually make the most of the hardware's impressive specs and show what the console can really do. To put this in context, despite the overwhelming public perception that the PS1 is superior to its Sega counterpart when it comes to 3D graphics, the Sega Saturn can produce far more textured polygons than the PlayStation. An impressive 140,000 per second compared to a snivelling 90,000 in fact. Wah wah wee wah! To compound problems further, it seemed that Sega of America and Sega of Japan had very different ideas about the direction of this new technology, with Sega of America campaigning hard for a new graphics chip to be developed for the system. Honestly, all I ever seem to talk about is Sega of America and Sega of Japan arguing with each other. It's like can't we all just get along? American branch president, real life action hero and a certified bad mama jamma, Tom Kalinske was quoted as saying, we fought against the architecture of the Saturn for some time. He was supposedly close to brokering a deal with Silicon Graphics about designing a more functional processor for the Saturn, but the proposal was rejected by these stuffy old suits at Sega of Japan, and Silicon Graphics ultimately took whatever progress they'd made on the project with them over to Nintendo, when they partnered with them on the design of the Nintendo 64. The fact that Sega of America was also busy toiling away on the soon to be released 32X, which was about to be made entirely redundant by Sega of Japan's new Saturn, meant the relationship between the two branches of the company was exceedingly strained, with Kalinsky's band of merry men essentially being forced to compete against themselves. What a complete mess. Things would come to a head when Sega of Japan announced the launch date for the Saturn on home turf, which would come in the exact same week as the 32X was due to be launched in the States. 
Released on the 22nd of November 1994 in Japan at a fairly reasonable price of 44,800 yen, the Sega Saturn completely sold out the initial shipment of 200,000 units in a single day, with a big part of that rapid success being the enormous popularity of Virtua Fighter, which was a fairly authentic and faithful port of the arcade game, which was the de rigueur at the time, and sold at an almost a one-to-one -one rate with the Saturn console itself. That means that almost every single person that bought a Saturn also bought a copy of a Virtua Fighter. Impressive! Slightly less impressive, however, when you consider that the only other game available at launch was an obscure FMV and text-based game, Wan Chai Connection, which is essentially just a load of pictures and text boxes filled with funny-looking hieroglyphics. Sega of Japan was desperate to also have Panzer Dragoon and Clockwork Knight available on the day of the system's release. However, due to unforeseen development delays, alas, that was not meant to be. After the initial wave of units sold out, Sega sneakily waited until the launch of the PlayStation on the 3rd of December to ship more to retailers, increasing demand for the system and bringing it to a crescendo, just in time for their new biggest rival's console to hit store shelves. An unscrupulous tactic indeed, but one that paid off for the sneaky sneaksters, as when the two consoles were sold side by side, the Saturn did prove to be more popular. A tremendous first month for Sega's new 32-bit hardware, and with several highly anticipated games and big hitters soon to be released, and the upcoming American launch on the horizon, things were looking serious rosy for the Saturn. Surely nothing could go wrong now. By the end of 1994, it looked like history was all but written, with it seeming close to certain that the Saturn would end up being the more successful console, having shifted just over half a million units compared to the PlayStation's 300,000. Both Sony and Sega realised, however, that the biggest, most important and most lucrative market at the time was going to be America, so plans started to be drawn up on the best and most conducive ways to crack that market wide open. In March of 1995, it was announced by the old silver-haired devil himself, Tom Kalinske, that Sega's new console would be released to the States on Saturday, the 2nd of September 1995, cleverly dubbed Saturn Day. This was until perennial mood ruiners of Sega of Japan mandated that the release be brought forward completely out of the blue to try and give them every possible advantage over Sony's PlayStation, which was also due to launch in September. A good and rather bold idea on paper, but an absolutely terrible one in practice. I'm not here to judge or cast aspersions, but it can't just be me that's noticing that the vast majority of Sega's bad ideas and balmy decision making seems to come directly from their Japanese offices. With little choice other than to yield to the wishes of his demanding Japanese overlords, on that fateful date of the 11th of May 1995, at the very first E3 event in Los Angeles. With a heavy heart, Tom Kalinske took to the stage and gave a keynote presentation in which he revealed several details about the Saturn and its capabilities, as well as its intended launch price of $399, which, when adjusted for inflation, would be a pretty astonishing $750 in today's future money. Gaming was expensive, but a necessity for gracious living.
He also revealed that the system would come with the immensely popular Virtua Fighter, which took some of the sting away from the hefty asking fee. But next would come to the bombshell that absolutely no one expected or was remotely prepared for. Kalinsky let it be known that due to high consumer demand, 30,000 Sega Saturn consoles had already been shipped to various electronics, games and toy stores across the country for immediate release right there and then, a full four months before the release date everyone expected. Rather than everyone jumping for joy at their cheeky little surprise as Sega had expected, both consumers and retailers were absolutely furious, with several large and influential chains such as Best Buy and Walmart heavily criticising Sega for not forewarning them of any such plans. KB Toys were so indignant that they even went so far as to drop Sega from their upcoming retail line completely. This was an absolutely devastating blow for the company as KB Toys were one of the biggest toy chains and one of the biggest sellers of video games in the country at that point. Oh Sega, you bunch of silly sausages, what are you like? To compound matters further, their day was thoroughly ruined when the head of Sony Interactive Entertainment, Steve Race, took to the stage during Sony's inaugural E3 with possibly the biggest mic drop in gaming history. He calmly walked up to the podium as if he was starring in a corporate version of 8 Mile and simply said the words, 2 99 before strutting back to his seat like the coolest man who ever lived to riotous applaud it was the worst news sega could have hoped for sony had undercut them by 25 percent of the console's value and subsequently taken all the hype and attention away from the Saturn. The wind had been completely taken out of Sega's sails after the promising Japanese launch where the future looked bright and sunny. Things had taken a sharp and rather immediate turn, with the console's future now appearing decidedly darker and grimmer. The somewhat slim selection of six games available on launch in the US wasn't exactly inspiring consumers to rush out and commit to buying a Saturn, which didn't particularly help matters. It's certainly not the worst lineup of launch games ever seen, but it's not exactly top draw either. Two sports titles in Sega Worldwide Soccer and Pebble Beach Golf Links, two arcade ports in Virtua Fighter and Daytona USA, the cartoony 2.5D platformer Clockwork Knight and the on-rails shooter all-time classic Panzer Dragoon. Given that all the previously announced third-party titles still weren't due around this system's original September launch, there was a heavy reliance on original Sega titles and ports of Sega-developed arcade games, and it was slim pickings for the first few months of the console's life. It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. I need better writers, you stupid monkey! It also became clear that Virtua Fighter wasn't quite the system seller that it was over in Japan, which meant Sega just didn't have any titles to really capture the American public's imagination and thus failed to capitalise on their early launch, making it a little more than a rather fruitless and costly stunt. By the time the next batch of games started coming out, Sony's PlayStation was also hitting store shelves with a far more impressive and attractive lineup of games, including several massively hyped and sought after titles such as Ridge Racer and Wipeout. 
despite Sega supposedly having the advantage with four extra months worth of consumer base building and brand loyalty, Sony's PlayStation was immediately outselling the Saturn and literally within a matter of days they had sold more units than Sega had in those entire first four months. The writing was on the wall at this point. And that writing probably said something like, The end is nigh. Send help, please. But we've talked about America and Japan, but what about over here in Europa? To tell you the truth, things weren't looking much better in PAL regions, with press and retailers completely overwhelmed with the decision to move the Saturn's launch forward by several months, leaving them with little time to prepare for marketing and selling the troublesome device. Advertising was pretty minimal, particularly over here in the UK, with a surprising lack of visibility for such a supposedly big important console, especially when compared to the PlayStation's ad campaigns, which were absolutely everywhere. Supposedly, Sony spent close to five times the amount of money that Sega did on advertising in the UK, and it showed, as by November Sony's little box that could was outselling Sega's chunky old Saturn by three to one. Now that can't be good. Things have continued to capitulate for the Saturn over the coming months, with Sony's revelatory new system, gaming momentum and notoriety at every turn. The PlayStation was becoming an iconic piece of history, woven into the fabric of the pop culture tapestry, while Sega's 32-bit Albatross was being overlooked and forgotten. The problematic Saturn hardware meant fewer games were forthcoming, and often the ones that did come out were slightly lesser versions of their PlayStation counterparts, with Sony's exclusive titles proving to be almost universally more popular than Sega's offerings. Although the system maintained a healthy existence in Japan, far outlasting the console in any other region, with significantly more games available, the system's failures in the West started before the hardware was even released. Pair this with an incredibly complicated set of CPUs which gave all the developers a massive headache the Sega Saturn was in trouble. Further combine this with the amount of confusion, annoyance and brand dissatisfaction that came about as a result of their dubious decision to bring the console's launch forward, insurmountable damage was done. While there is no doubt in my mind that the Sega Saturn has a fantastic library of games that are often overlooked today, the number of poor decisions that Sega would make surrounding the platform would mean that the plan was almost doomed to fail from the start. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the rise and the fall of the Sega Saturn. So. As is usual, like, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell, all of the usual things that people ask you to do at the end of their videos. Then get my face tattooed on your right bum cheek and then send me a picture to prove it because if there isn't a picture, it didn't happen. So normally I like to answer a question from my patrons at the end of my videos, but today I shan't. A lot of you have been asking me where my new catchphrase, a necessity for gracious living has come from. And basically, the truth is, I have picked it up off of something that I've watched recently. Now, before I go into that, I just want to explain something which is totally relevant, I promise. I grew up in a town called Frinton on Sea, which is a very nice little town. It's very pretty, but it is unaccountably um, very, very pretentious. It's a weird town. It was a weird place to grow up. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, when I say it's unaccountably pretentious, what I mean by that is that a lot of, I'd say probably the elderly people there now who have lived their, their whole lives, you'd think that they were Downton Abbey 
and they, they're not they're not Downton Abbey I mean this is this is a town that is smack bang in the middle of Walton on the Naze and Clacton on Sea bearing in mind that Jaywick is in Clacton Jaywick the UK's most deprived area in the whole of the UK Jaywick and that's like five miles up the road from Frinton so yes unaccountably pretentious people think they're posh if they live there so some old archive footage was released online from Anglia television um, the other month which was about Frinton so basically this um, typical 1960s Queen's English sounding reporter has gone to Frinton to do um, basically I suppose a news article or something about a huge controversy where people were absolutely spitting feathers and were so cross because a block of flats was being built on the seafront and the way that they had portrayed it was that you had the goodies who were like the unaccountably posh people who lived there who wanted to keep Frinton very exclusive and you had the person who was building it who was a bit of a wide boy geezer um, cockney fella who had bought this building knocked it down was in the process of constructing this block of um, 60 flats and um, yeah so it was really weird um, you had the people um, basically talking giving their opinions on it but they were talking about things like oh well we, we're very exclusive here we want to keep it exclusive we don't even have a public house don't you know and we don't even allow buses within the gates I mean at Frinton there there are like railway gates and there used to be like a full-time um, a full-time guard there who would open and close the gates whenever the train was coming past and it had been that way since oh god since like the 1920s and um yeah it's just like weird they didn't allow buses there until like a couple of decades ago really 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 weird uh, we had um a pub finally open about 10 or 15 years ago there were protests protests about a pub which is now heavingly busy like every evening and weekend and um so going back to this article this reporter was obviously having to give context to Frinton before it led into the main part of the article and it was showing cafes and restaurants that are still there now um, and one of them is a florist called Florette Florette is still there but yes basically the comment this reporter gave was Ah yes, flowers, a necessity for gracious living. And I found that so funny that I decided I had to incorporate that. Because let's be honest, flowers are not a necessity for gracious living. They're nice to have, they're not a bloody necessity. I thought it was so funny that I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I went, oh look, um, Animal Crossing, a necessity for gracious living. It's just funny, it doesn't make sense because it's not but it's funny and a lot of gamers are very precious about their certain things and I mean like <laughs> look how precious I get about stuff but I won't die if my mega duck goes missing so that's basically it that's the story um, I'll see if I can find it online if I can I'll post a link to it either in the description or um, in a pinned comment but yes if you have any more sort of burning questions usually I would save this slot for my patrons so if you enjoyed this video then as I said earlier like subscribe comment and all of that and if you really like what I do then please consider backing my channel over on patreon thank you very much for sticking around until this point and I shall see you all in the next video or flowers a necessity for gracious living